Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Barcelona for MWC 2024, formerly Mobile World Congress, now MWC. I'm John Furrier, your host with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise as we always do. Day three, we're kicking off with our featured guest here, Charlie Kawas, who's the president of Broadcom. As you know, the world is moving to AI and the number one thing that everyone is looking at right now is how to make that possible. And it goes down to the silicon, it comes down to the chips, it comes down to the hardware, it comes down to the software. The systems revolution is the big story here at MWC and we're pleased to have Charlie Kawas here for President Broca. Charlie, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your valuable time. Appreciate thank, you. Thank you, thank you John and Dave for having me here. As you can see, it's super busy, hectic, yes. so appreciate the, the time you're spending with me. You guys have been just phenomenal on the business front. The fundamentals are off the charts, obviously, the valuation, revenue, up from like from 20, 10 years ago, $4 billion, pushing over $35 billion, R&D, less than a billion 10 years ago, now well over five billion, and with VMware, that's only going to get bigger. Um, you have the broadest, if not the broadest, silicon capability from architecture, processor memory, protocol, signal processing, and connectivity in the planet. You guys are leading the, the revolution of the systems revolution that's happening now, um, and you're in charge. You and Hawk Tan are, are running the ship here. Now you got VMware, you got the chips to the stack and the application layer all kind of coming together, and look at NVIDIA, look at all the success out there. Everybody wants AI. You guys are at the front driver's seat of this. What's it like? I mean, do you wake up and pinch yourself in the morning and say, wow, we're really doing and, this? And what are you doing here at MWC? Okay, so <laughs> what am I doing here? Let me start <laughs> with that. So, um, MWC came to Barcelona in 2006. Right. So we've been here, and I've been here actually <laughs> since 2006, oh, okay. 18 years, almost two decades. It's incredible to see the transition of what happened from 2006 till today. At the time in 2006, let alone in 2019, nobody talked about AI as much. Today it's the only topic people are talking about, forgetting a little bit about 5G and what happens beyond 5G. So what are we doing here? You're right, Broadcom, the first word in Broadcom is, is broad. And you're right, the portfolio we have is broad, especially with the addition of our uh, sisters and brothers from VMware who are actually just close by. Um, we are very excited about the work we've been doing for decades with the service providers. And the reason why we're here is the time and effort that we've been spending literally for decades with these operators and service providers. And what's exciting this year is, as I said, and as you said, we have a new family member, VMware. Uh, VMware have invested in over two decades in terms of bringing virtualization and software capability for a full stack for the operators, not just in their data centers from an IT point of view, but I would say equally, if not more importantly, across the network and the capabilities that it can bring there. And so we're very excited about this new level of engagement for the Broadcom family uh, with our sisters and brothers from VMware. But if I focus on the hardware side, which is the business I'm responsible for, Look, the exciting piece, every morning when I get up, for me, is like a little kid in Toys R Us. <laughs> we have everything in terms of technology yeah. from starting from the handheld devices, yeah. wireless, all the way as you get into the first base stations, backhaul, you get into access networks, metro networks, core networks, and ultimately data centers and cloud. One of the statistics that we've been very proud of, more than 99% of any service provider traffic, actually, goes through at least one Broadcom chip. And so, for us not to be here with our uh, customers and partners and operators uh, would be a big miss. So, very, very excited to be here. So, 2006, the uh, Mobile World Congress, which it was called at the time, was actually at the original theater in Barcelona. Now we're not, quite in Barcelona, we're in some, just in the outskirts, a town that I can't really pronounce that well, Opatilat or something like that. But at any rate, back then, Charlie, the world was CPU centric. And several years ago, I saw a video that you did where you were predicting that the world was moving from a CPU centric environment, 2006, the PC revolution, to a connect centric environment. And that struck me. And I started to learn more about what Broadcom was doing. And obviously that bet has paid off. But for our audience, can you explain that premise and how it's transpired and what it means for the future. Yeah, 
So well, first of all, thank you for noticing that and bringing it up. This is actually something that's very dear to my heart, personally, especially with my background and my career. I actually believe, um, depending on the workload, there are data centers, infrastructure worlds, that the CPU and the processor is the center and the heart of that system. When you talk AI, everything has changed because with AI you have these elephant workloads that cannot run on a single processor. Whether it's a GPU, TPU, NPU, the flavor of the day, let's call them for the next 15 minutes XPUs. <laughs> so if you take these XPUs and you, you take some of these elephant workloads, you can't run them on a single XPU. You can't even run them on eight CPUs or XPUs or GPUs. You have to now scale into the thousands today, thousands of these. In order to do that, you've transcended now a single system where you've scaled up. Now you have to scale out to many, many of these systems and racks, and you have to interconnect them. And guess what? If you don't have the right network strategy and connectivity strategy, this will not work. This will not scale up. I want, to, I want to double down on that because one of the things we're hearing here at MWC this year, obviously, is the emphasis of its telco connectivity. I got to connect stuff. That's been around for a while, okay, check. AI is the focus, and they say, okay, I got to tune the software for every single system I build for that AI. There's no like common yet system because the workloads are different. Generative AI is completely diverse in its, in its capabilities. So the question is, what does AI need from a chip standpoint to make it work because the, everyone's putting clusters together. Nick switches, components, they're essentially building their own new systems. Not by scratch, but you guys are supplying that, but like you're starting to see clusters, GPU clusters, uh, micro clouds are emerging. We saw that at HPC at Supercomputing 23, we'll be there next year. We'll probably see more HPC AI together, which is again, another sign. These new systems, need to be built, what is AI actually using? And, and why are people doing this? And what's the right approach? So look, super fun question. Honestly, I'm spending the majority of my time on this, both with the engineers inside Broadcom, but even more exciting with the engineers, especially yeah. with the hyperscalers. So on AI, especially generative AI, I would say more than 80% today of the spend is a handful of companies, a handful of hyperscalers. And this is a phenomenal challenge for an engineer. It's actually equally phenomenal for a business person. So if you combine both and you say, we've got a huge scale challenge here on an engineering side, but also how do we make sure that this actually will be monetized? We're working on these two things. Today it's a little bit orthogonal. The more you try to do on the engineering, the more you're going to actually have to spend tens of billions of dollars per single super cluster. So when you look at this, the way we look at it, and the feedback that consistently have, have been getting from the, the customers we have, but specifically the hyperscalers, comes down to three things. One, a lot of the systems that exist today are proprietary closed. Having an engineering background, I tell you the best innovation over the last 300 years, three centuries, come through open platforms. So the first thing that I think needs to happen in these generative AI and large clusters is open. This is really key. And a lot of the investments we're making, yeah. whether it's on the Ethernet side, whether it's on the PCIe side, optics side, um, interconnects, NICs, as you mentioned, for us in delivering an open platform based on either standards that exist or standards we're collaborating with the industry with. Ultra Ethernet Consortium is one example. Yep. Many mm -hmm. others. So first, open. Two, you talked about the clusters, and the okay. clusters require scale. And I mentioned this in the previous question you asked. We're not talking anymore about a cluster of 4,096 uh, XPUs. Today, some of the largest clusters we're seeing are in the range of 24,000 to 32,000 XPUs, okay? okay? The problem is, that's not enough. Okay, what do people want today, what we're hearing? They want to scale it beyond 100,000. They want to scale it beyond 500,000. Well, guess what? The second thing is scale. How do we scale this? One more thing I want to tell you. Yeah. All of this is, yeah. is fun. Yeah. Once you look at the power, 
of a single XPU, forget everything else around it, it's in the hundreds of watts today. If you go to 100,000 of these, low power yeah. becomes key. So I want you to remember these three things. Open, scale, and low power, OSP. I'm going to come back and ask you about these things. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> okay, we'll, go, we'll be studying for the quiz. First yeah. of all, I love that you use the term supercluster. Yes. Supercluster, a great way to describe it. So let's talk about the investment you're making. I, my question is, where are you guys investing? Because when you have the clusters and you have NICs in there, the question will come up, what about performance? Is there any degradation of performance when you have all these NICs, you have all these XPUs together, what's the performance criteria? How do you guys look at that and how do you uh, answer that engineering around the performance of the NIC. Is it faster Ethernet? I know that's been getting an increase in speed. Uh, open is, love the open question, but like what's the performance challenge there? Is it a problem? Or how do you guys solve that? So, I want to take you to the foundational technologies because that's what we invest in ultimately and we take all these foundational technologies and build the products that we're talking about. So foundational technologies from Broadcom is around connectivity. So, Dave, going back to yep. connect-centric yep. or network-centric is the future, absolutely. The, the platform is going to be the network, not the XPU down the road as you get to these things. So, foundational technologies like CERTES. We have the best CERTES technology in the world delivering today 100 gigabits per second at capabilities that actually take the standard. They're standard based on IEEE and we can deliver 2x the margin that the standard needs. Why is this important? When I take 100 gig 30s and I can deliver, let's call it 45 dB capabilities, it means now I can run these networks on four meter copper cables. When you run it on four meter copper cables, when the standard calls for two, you can play, completely change the way you interconnect these platforms at much lower power, significantly lower cost. So that's one example. As you take now this one example of foundational technologies, now we say Ethernet. Take Tomahawk family. Yep. Tomahawk family in a decade, two orders of magnitude in a decade yep. is what we increase the capacities to. So today, we're the only company shipping in volume with a single monolithic chip, 51 terabits per second. Now, the more interesting piece, remember OSP, we're going to come back to that. <laughs> That's 90% less power than what we did 10 years ago. So when you think of this foundational technology and you say, okay, well, what would be the next step? 200 gig. Well, can we deliver the same thing at 200 gig? Can we go now, instead of 51T, can we go to double that? We take that technology, apply it to the NICs. We take that technology, apply it to Jericho AI, and so forth. Now, to focus a little bit on the power, even though we dropped the power by 90%, and we're going now from five nanometer to future, lower power technologies, guess what? We need to now out-innovate in a different dimension. So we're starting to bring our optics capability into the equation, and we're saying, if we now bring silicon photonics, co-package yeah. it with the Tomahawk 5, the power that dropped 90%, will drop another 40, 50% on top of that. So it's quite disruptive and exciting in terms of what's coming. So can you explain, thank you for that explanation. I mean, the, the, the business model and the R&D model of Broadcom is very, very focused. Yes. And it has implications on the sustainability of your customer base and also your, your sales and marketing costs. Can you share with the audience your philosophy? Because it's very different than what we often see in the technology industry. So, so we term and coin this capability and strategy and model uh, sustainable franchise. So in Broadcom today, and it, by the way, it's applicable to hardware, systems, yeah. and software. Yeah. Uh, and by hardware, I mean semiconductor silicon. And that's where it, the genesis of this, this is where it started. Um, so what does that mean to have a sustainable franchise? We have 26 of them today. Nine on the software side and 17 on the hardware side. It comes down to first, believe it or not, many people don't think of it this way, the market. So for us, it, we spend time making sure that when we want to invest in a market, we invest for at least a decade. Many people don't know this about Broadcom actually. So when we say we are in a certain business, we commit to 10 years plus. 
That is extremely important for us. Now, most people say, I want to invest in a space that has a hockey stick. Many people do that. Yeah. That's not what we do. Sometimes it happens to be like AI and generative AI, Can which could is be great. Big, yeah. But you know what? That's not what we're looking for. Even if a market in 10 years is declining low single digits, that is actually exciting for us. For many people, it's boring, it's legacy. Big, big, big mistake. So first, the market, 10 years plus. Two, most importantly, technology leadership. That is the most important thing that we do at Broadcom. In the 26 categories, and specifically the 17 on the hardware side, we have to be the technology leader over that span of 10 years. So if you look at a span of 10 years, sometimes a company A might be the leader, the next gen, another company so just, to clarify, just to clarify, so your philosophy on the market is, it's got to be big, but it doesn't have to be growing. It's got to be, uh, established. Established, big yeah. enough to do some things in, but Correct. you're not chasing growth curves. No. There, there might be growth curves you'll hit, like AI. Correct. Because it just happens to be what you you're focused it. on. Correct. But the franchise is a durable business sustainable model, sustainable, franchise. okay, Correct. got it, okay. So, so market, market and technology leadership. That's the second one. So technology is super key. We, and you said that, over yeah. $5 billion is what we invest in annually, and VMware is making this larger. On top of that, we make sure technology comes from IP, IP comes from the brains of engineers we have. We invest heavily yeah. in our engineers, heavily. And we make sure that whatever technology we bring yeah. to that market is the best technology in the world. The third thing we do is seamless execution. And with that, we have to deliver specific business parameters for that leadership in technology, for that durable market. Yeah. And each category over a span of X amount of years, way less than five, has to be the number one and sustain that leadership from a technology and a business point of view. So it comes down to these three things. And I've heard- the Number one's a scoreboard. You got to maintain the number one position. Look, number twos get cut or they kind of give a chance to get back to number one again. Look, uh, I think, <laughs> I think we've, done, we've done this almost for two decades and we've done it across different, different areas. I, I think with the right engineers, and ensuring that you have the right level of investment, out investing anybody else. Sometimes we out invest the entire industry in that space. Actually, it works incredibly well. And, and I've heard, and it relates to what John was just asking, I've heard Hawk Tan talk to Wall Street that each of those business units, what would you say, 27, are independent, 26, 26 and they have to stand on their own. You don't Correct. allow them to intermix because it gets fuzzy. A lot of organizations would say, well, that's inefficient. You know, we want to centralize everything, but you take a different philosophy. Yeah. They each have to drive their own P&L and, and be a leader. Correct. Is that right? Now, to be fair, we do have, I have a separate dedicated team that reports to me that we call it central engineering. Yep. So we have a central engineering team, but that central engineering team will do the foundational things I talked uh, about, yeah. like CERDES, libraries, yep. uh, process technology. We have that. Now, once you take these foundational things and let's say you want to build a switch, that becomes a sustainable franchise. They're responsible for delivering this. And we have a term called no crutches, okay? You have to be number one on your own with your engineers. If you don't, you don't, build, you don't deserve to be on yeah. the platform. And that central engineering team feeds the P&Ls. It's All not a P&L in and of itself, correct? correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. You yeah, got so you it. got a great business model, fundamentals, so get like the lay of the land, give people the, the foundation, give them the investment, give them the target market to go after, give them the scoreboard metric, go, and they do it. Correct. And you, and you feed that. Correct. The formula works. Yes. Okay, now what's interesting is, is that in today's market, that kind of is interesting, because you have all the piece parts. I mean, you simplify your business to Wall Street, we got, we got chips and software, I get that, and it's a lot of divisions. But the bigger picture right now is that people are actually changing their business models mm -hmm. around their actual infrastructures and how they do business with their technology. The computer industry Correct. is completely resetting. I agree. So, it, just the world just spun in your direction and now people are looking at, okay, how do I change from my data center to cloud, they did that. Mm -hmm. How do I go from distributed computing, cloud, hybrid, on-premise, and now edge, and now device mobility. I mean, it's the perfect storm. That's where AI seems to be hitting. So back to AI, how does someone take advantage of Broadcom? Yeah. If I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business, I need to create a new enablement model to build in my next generation, next 20 years of my business. 
what, how do you speak to that specific situation as AI unfolds? What is that enablement that Broadcom brings to the well, table John, with AI? I knew you were going to bring us back to AI. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. All All right. We love AI. All We've right. been drinking the All AI right. Kool-Aid for so, like a long time. Uh, so th this is the um, awesome part. Actually, you're right. We're going through a big inflection point that happens actually sometimes once a decade or sometimes once every two decades. So with AI, the model that we have with, with this structure that I described before, first, on the semiconductor side, we build merchant silicon, and that's important. And the merchant silicon is about the connect-centric or network-centric capability. And it is about, yeah. okay, let me see if you remember, open, open scalable, scale and, and power. lower power. power. Yeah. And I tell you, so those abilities that we drive today can be applied to hyperscalers who are absolutely investing each tens of billions of dollars, but it can be taken all the way down to an enterprise level that want to do their own inference on-prem yeah. or build their own platform on-prem. We can do that with the merchant silicon piece and the, most of the products that we have play in that role. So I would say more than 80, 90% of the products we have are merchant, open, enable the scale at a low power. But on the other end of the spectrum, when somebody has massive volume of such platform, Sometimes they say, I don't want the merchant play, I want to have a custom play. And that's the engagement model that we've changed, where we said, okay, well, let me bring my foundational technologies, you bring your foundational technologies and software, and let's sit down and say, okay, if you're going to build a cluster that is, call it 32,000 uh, processors or 100,000, how do we do that from an open, platform that is actually very scalable at a very low power, because I tell you, power is the number one issue that we're having right now. And bringing that foundational technology in a custom or hybrid play is another big differentiator that I think yeah. we have the ability to do. Do you, think, do you think a company that is, and I'm trying to think of industry examples, uh, that is proprietary, can embrace open and in a, in a seamless way that is not disruptive. I'm trying to think of an example. Look at IBM, they're almost the exception that proves the rule. They were proprietary and now they're you know, much more open with Red Hat and it took, it's taken decades for them to get back. Some of the hyperscalers, you could say, are pretty good. What do you, what do you think about that? Is it just a, a company's DNA that's proprietary? They, they, they will get stuck in that, that, that mud for a long yeah. time? Or do you feel like the industry is so vibrant and open that they can respond? I think innovation, as, as, it, as it sparks, initially starts with a proprietary approach because it'll be innovated, let's say, by maybe a handful of companies. In many cases, it's a single company. Yep. So as that spark happens, traditionally, it is proprietary. Yeah. The, the challenge is, is if it becomes such a disruptive force, just like we're discussing, I think bringing a million or two million or five million engineers across the ecosystem over a span of 10 years, remember the sustainable franchise, will out-innovate any single company in the world. It yeah. takes time, it's not a, a six months or a year, it's many, many years. And that's what we're committed to. This is why you see us invest heavily, actually with our peers in the industry and our partners and customers where we say, Let's, we found it. We were the founding member for Ultra Ethernet Consortium. You know what? That's going to help yeah. us innovate. Of course, if we take the power that we have in Ethernet and do it on our own, we will create for the next three years something so cool that nobody else has. But, then... but long term, is that the right thing to do for all of us? No. You know, I remember, the, I remember when I was growing up in the industry, Open Systems Interconnect was a big part of the revolution Correct. that took proprietary to open. It kind of stopped that TCP, but everyone's got standard at the chip level and Correct. hardware. That created massive innovation wave and wealth creation, frankly. So, we're kind of in that moment again, so the question I want to ask you is, as these clustered systems, as we call them, are emerging, and you see them everywhere. People are standing up custom clouds and, and powers the constraint, so they're Correct. engineering it, and you guys are a big part of that, so congratulations. As this next level comes, where's the investment from Broadcom, and what do customers need to do to build these next-gen clusters? Is it the NIC or the switch? Because now, you guys do both, NIC and switch, it's connectivity-based. In the cluster is the NIC, they work together, it used to be the switch was the, was the king of the castle, now you got Nix, as you mentioned, 
connecting thousands and tens of thousands of XPUs. Yeah. What's your focus on that? NICs or switches or both? What's the Look, absolutely both. I think, I think part of the open, uh, scalable and power to, draw, to enable these three things, I think we got to do it across all of this. So if I may take you back to, I think the second question you asked, the way I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the entire infrastructure. So as I said, you go back to an XPU, you have to scale up. So when you scale up, there are things now we're doing inside that XPU yeah. in terms of not all, today, everybody I would say in order to build an XPU has to go to two and a half D and we're starting to see uh, a path toward yeah. the chiplet. By the way, that is another disruptive area. Number three, you, so you go to 3D where you go chip on chip or die on die. After you scale up, you have to go to scale out. Guess what, when you scale out, it's all about the switch. You have to have the best performance switch with yeah. the lowest latency, no yeah. packet drops, the ability to actually take these yeah. uh, elephant uh, workloads and be able to yeah. deliver them with low latency. Yeah. Then you have to interconnect them. <laughs> then yeah. Yeah. you have to go to the front end networks. And so when you look at these sort of four components, yeah. scale up, scale out, front end, and the interconnect for each of these, these are the areas where yeah. I believe, not just the NIC, by the way, and the switch, I believe the XPUs have to play part of that. I believe the optics have to play part of it, the interconnects. And so all of these, what I call foundational to cluster yeah. level, system level cluster technologies have to come hand in hand. I got to ask you about chiplets. You brought yes. up chiplets. I, 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 saw, yeah, I saw that. He's lit up. They're in my ear, Dave. <laughs> but chiplets are not new, right? I mean, IBM did chiplets no, 40 years correct. ago. Yeah, it's not so, new. But, but it's interesting, <laughs> the time to market benefits, there are cost benefits. My question is, to somebody who really understands deeply, technically, the connect centricity, in a monolithic system, my understanding is you've got a big shared SRAM, and all those XPUs, this, yeah. you don't have to, we know what they are. They're sharing that SRAM, it's, it's very, very fast. Yeah. Chiplets, you, you, you've got relatively slower connections is what I understand, and they're asynchronous. How do you, but so huge market for that, but, but I see a market for both monolithic and chiplet. Am I understanding that correctly? I wonder yeah. if you could give us your perspective. So the way we're looking at this is, is really to help around at least two of the uh, OSP things. And remember what OSP stood for? Open, yeah, open scalable, scalable power. 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 Oh, you got it, yeah, perfect, yeah. you guys found it. <laughs> we've so, we've fallen the bouncing so, ball right now. So <laughs> on, on scale and power especially, yeah. it could apply by the way to the O as well, but on scale and power. As we go from five nanometer to three nanometer, um, and three nanometer is done for us, now we're actually starting to work and actually have full product designs in two. two yeah. it, this foundational technologies that I talked about, it doesn't make sense to take all of these technologies every single node and yeah. keep building monolithic chips. Why? Because as you go towards two, you can keep running that transistor faster and faster. So actually it becomes a big penalty from a cost point of view yeah. to take all these technologies all the way to two or sub two. So what happens at that point in time is it starts making sense to say, you know, certain technologies, let's say 30s, maybe it makes sense, especially mixed signal, that I keep them in a certain node where the power is optimal and the cost is the lowest. And I build it once. And then the core, whether it's a switch or a processor or what my, it might be, that I can keep optimizing it because it's more digital and I'll take it to other and other technologies. And so as you do this, it completely takes that cluster you talked about, not necessarily all the way up beyond the data center, the exciting piece, it takes us inside yeah. that chip. Yeah. So it actually disaggregates that capability and it allows us to focus on what's the right technology in the right platform. So hence, power yeah. would yeah. be significantly less and then scale yeah. allows us to scale that in a much better way. And it way. gives you more flexibility, is exactly. clearly what totally. you're saying. And, I love, I, and I love the scale out, scale up uh, concept there because you know, if you look at distributed computing, clouds was, is horizontally scalable, compute, that's great, and you know, obviously you got scaling up with the apps yeah. in the cloud, but if you go with distributed computing, edge and on-premise cloud operations, that's essentially distributed computing, we know that, we, totally. lo we love that. Okay, so now coming back to the market, Scale, hyperscalers are, are the big customer right now. Absolutely. As 
the traditional enterprise, we're talking about IT people running general purpose infrastructure from switches and stuff they had before, racks of servers, top of rack switch, stuff that was old school, now going to clustered systems. The big challenge we're seeing with the AI focus is that might be inadequate or ineffective for some of these foundational models. So if you look at the open source movement of Llama and now Mistral, although Mistral has got some issues, but they're coming up in capabilities and totally. adoption to some of the proprietary open AI other ones. So that means that there's more demand to host those. So the question is, how do the, the hyperscale cluster models that are today being invested in come down to the mainstream enterprise? Because that's going to replace those racks with clusters. Correct. And it's going to look a lot like the cloud. Correct. But it's got to be easy enough <laughs> so that Dell and HP and Lenovo, all your customers Absolutely. that were doing servers yes. and have NICs yeah. can build the new thing. Yeah, I That's agree. That's coming. Yes. Do you I, agree actually, with that? Uh, totally. Actually, as a matter of fact, another driver for this is data privacy oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and governance. Yeah. Certain workloads cannot leave the premise. Right. And so, how do you solve that? So that piece we're excited about. I think it's coming, as you said. The, the, the thing I'm also excited about is not just the enterprise. Actually, if you go back to October of 23, okay, five months ago, Comcast announced that they're collaborating with us, and we're very proud of that, to enable AI inside the CPE at home. Yeah. So we're going a step Which, by the way, you have chips in the set-top boxes. <laughs> so set-top boxes, <laughs> gateways, next generation pawn systems, and I tell you, yeah. two benefits coming out of that. Yeah. So we're seeing actually this capability move all the way to the edge, not just to the enterprise, yeah. and we actually have that in production today, two advantages of it. The first advantage, using that capability and these models yeah. to completely change OPEX. So OPEX would be significantly lowered using that technology all the way to the CPE. Because there's so much data that today is not mined. You can train on it, inference, and be able, instead of having technicians reactively dispatch, proactively eliminate them. Two, ARPU, and that's part of why I'm here, going back to your first <laughs> question. <laughs> this capability, what we call NPU on-premise, which we have today in production, this is not a PowerPoint or sampling, we have it can enable new services for the yeah. service providers and operators today. They're excited about it, we're collaborating yeah. with them, we're enabling that at the edge today. And you're seeing uptake there today. So we've, it's our power law of AI. We said that, that very domain specific you know, AI is going to happen on-prem. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the data is. It just right. makes so much exactly. sense. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And the enablement's just going to be off the charts. So if you connect the dots, okay, as the evolution of this embryonic market continues to grow, Gets, enterprise gets reset with a kind of new architecture, call them clustered systems, that's my word. Yep. I think that's a good I word. I like that word, by it's the way. A, yeah. It's like it replaces the server. You're, not rack, you're just clustering, and, and the power is the constraint. It's, let's call it the evolution of the server. <laughs> evolution of the <laughs> server, <laughs> which is a good thing. People want yeah. more power, of course. Yeah. Open, scalable, low power. See, uh, you got yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Quick study here. Yeah. Um, and then the software will run it. So the enablement is the apps will run on multiple devices, whether it's set-top boxes, totally. CPE. In including devices. Yeah, yeah I mean, on-premise equipment. Yeah. So the, 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 all this is going to be good. The question on the business model front, because uh, this has been kind of a master class on both product and business, what should people be thinking about on the business model side? As an enterprise starts to rethink their architecture, yeah. what would you advise the CISO, the CIO, the CEO, we're going to enable this digital infrastructure. It's, it's a transformational journey, but it's now changed. The game so, has changed. So let me first start where tens of billions of dollars are being spent by a single hyperscaler, and there's several of these. Right. Let's start with a business model there before we go to the enterprise. Because yeah. if you're spending, let's say if you're yeah. running that budget and you're spending 30 plus billion a year, you better have a way to monetize this and some level of ROI. So starting with that, our view might be a little bit different yeah. than the industry on this. So our view actually is big picture, we see that this market has really two prongs. One consumer led and driven, the other one is enterprise. Let's start with the consumer side. So the consumer side is when you have a large consumer base, hundreds of millions, sometimes billions, and the model to monetize it there is the engagement with the consumer. So as you are able, to provide higher quality, let's say, content and reels to your consumers. 
the engagement model, and ultimately it translates down to eyeballs, is successful today. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that yeah. with a big check mark. And that's good because I think that segment will continue to invest yeah. significant amount of money for the foreseeable future, good for all of us, including Broadcom. Now let's pivot to the other segment, which is enterprise. Our view, we are not there yet. People are investing yeah. in big, big clusters, but the take is not there. Now the question is, will people continue to invest bi billions and tens of billions in this space, or would somebody in 24 or 25 come back and say, look, yeah. we have not figured it out, let's back off. Honestly, we don't know right now. <laughs> Nor do we. It's but, funny. But, but the fact that you started with consumer is so important and yeah. you have visibility in that because that's where the volume occurs, totally. that's where the innovation always occurs. We've seen it and by time the way, and time again. And by the way, here at the telco show, we asked some of the telcos what they think the disruption of AI is and they said you got to go to the device with the data yes. and bring that back. So yes. the life cycle of the data flows, again, back to the evolution of the server. By the way, it's tens of thousands of servers now. So it's uh, they're selling a lot of servers. Your clients are probably like, Pretty happy about this wave coming. Absolutely, <laughs> and we're happy about it too. But it's an amazing conversation because you're saying Broadcom doesn't chase the S-curve and the waves, but yet you are maybe not the number one AI company right now, but certainly one of the top. You, yeah. NVIDIA, Broadcom, and the hyperscalers. Yeah, you're I mean, on the you're wave. right in that mix and you happen to be thrown into that wave. No, you're so. not chasing the wave, you're in the wave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're, for you're, the yeah, record, by, by the way, we do a lot of collaboration and great work with NVIDIA. They're actually a great customer for me and they're actually yeah. one of my fastest growing customers. So hey. we, we actually collaborate and work with everybody, going back to the OSP, you got, you got remember? Two, oh, okay. It's a big yeah, wave, right. it's a big wave, Dave. You got two surfers on there. Um, so final question, we're going to wrap up. We're way so over much time. For, uh, it's, like a, it's like a podcast um, master class. Thank you for coming on. Uh, final, you. final question, a personal yeah. one. I know you got a, a deep multiple engineering degrees and you mentioned engineering multiple times. We are in probably the greatest renaissance of engineering um, right now, a new generation's coming in, AI's attracting a lot of young talent, new problems to solve. What's your vision for engineers out there who uh, want to solve problems? Uh, what are some of the problem spaces you see, opportunities for people to come in and bring their engineering minds and talent to the problems? What are some of the, it could be materials to software to signaling, what is the big opportunity? So I, I tell you, um, so I have four children, I am happy to tell you that two of them will be computer engineers. One just graduated <laughs> and doing his PhD in AI actually, and uh, the other is still in, in uh, college and one finishing high school. So I think this is the best time to be in engineering. We're biased, yeah. but this is the best time. If you go down to the materials, the level of innovation that needs to happen now as we hit two nanometer and sub two nanometer is phenomenal. How do you now take uh, these types of wafers and now start stacking these chips to do 3D because look, a single chip now, a reticle is 800 square million, it's done, it's over. We have so many now dice that are actually at 800. Yep. We need to stack them. So packaging is going to be, the, or advanced packaging I should say, would be the next level as well to invest in and work in. We're investing heavily in these first two elements. The third piece, I would say, is around what type of software models can we now innovate in where we can do training in the cloud, for example, or on-prem, but now we can take the inference all the way down to these types of devices. I think that area is probably the most exciting and unknown. We still don't know what we don't know because we don't know what type of innovation and models Think of about 24 years ago when the dot-com bubble happened. How many companies were out there? And if you now fast forward two and a half decades, out of these companies, a handful yep. actually, <laughs> or, right? Su succeeded but thrived in a bigger, in much bigger way, yep. trillion dollar valuation yep. plus. The same thing I think will happen over the next two decades. Yep. And we at Broadcom are super excited to be playing not just in the materials and yep. semiconductor way, but with so you see a great entrepreneurial opportunity coming. To totally, and for us, including VMware and hopefully even future things down the road. Charlie, thank you so much for your time. Again, we went over, this is like a master podcast class. Thank, thank you, you for spending your very valuable time and, and sharing with theCUBE, we appreciate it. Thank you. Charlie Kowals, oh. President of Broadcom here, kicking off day three live coverage. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, bringing you the great content here from Mobile World Congress. Stay with us for more live coverage after this short break. Mm -hmm.